Well, good evening all. What a fascinating subject we have in our studies of Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther. It has all the hallmarks, the qualities and the character of a bestseller. And why wouldn't it be? Because it's from the Word of God. It is from the Bible. It has intrigue, mystery, it has wickedness and courage. It also has the standard troublemakers, war and evil people. The list goes on and on. And yet, these three books would be right up there for conjecture. Of all the Hebrew scholars, commentaries, historians that I have looked at, I have found very few that actually fully agree. They may agree in points, but how they arrive at the conclusion, they come from different angles. I will also take this opportunity to say that I'm not a Hebrew scholar, and I am definitely not a historian. And therefore, I'm not authority on this matter. But what we're going to do this evening is consider the two main views that they are out there as far as how the structure of the chronology and of the kings are in Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther. So now our story begins in Daniel chapter 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he should accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto Adonai Yahweh to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now, when you read of that, and you read how Daniel prayed, remember Daniel had given the interpretation of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. And it would have been no doubt that this word would have spread and would have come to the notice of Darius the king. And so when Cyrus comes into power and he actually gets word, and there's no doubt in my mind that Darius would have given him some sort of background information on Daniel. And Daniel tells him that, do you know that your name was mentioned in Scripture hundreds of years ago? And he would have brought to his attention uh, Isaiah chapter 44. And it goes like this. That saith to the deep, be dry and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. And shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. And to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue all nations before him. Can you imagine what must have gone through Cyrus's mind when he realized that he'd been appointed by the God of heaven to enable and to set in place the restoration of the land of Israel as far as Jerusalem and the temple is concerned. And here is a man that had no concept of God. He didn't worship. He worshipped false gods. But he felt driven and compelled. And when we take a look, you probably won't see it as clearly from back there, but that's why I've given that documentation to you. You can see from those points, that's Isaiah. And then you get Jeremiah. And then you get Daniel. 
and then you get Cyrus. Now, in that timeline, it's approximately 200 years distance between the time prophesied by Isaiah to the time Cyrus actually gets this information and forms the decree and it sets forth the decree. And here's the decree itself. Because in Ezra chapter 1 at verse 2, Cyrus himself declares this, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, Yahweh God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Can you see the impact that this had on the man? He was so, so overwhelmed by the fact that a God had actually declared him before. And you see, this is the beauty of Bible prophecy. The absolute marvel of Bible prophecy is that you can have a timeline and you will have the likes of Daniel. And Daniel would prophesy by say, saying to Cyrus, this is what Yahweh, the God of heaven, has declared about you in his pages of scripture. The beauty of it is Cyrus didn't even have to believe him by word. He could actually physically look at the written word that Daniel would produce to him and look back and identify that it was written. But then Cyrus could also look at prophecies going forward into the future, even as far as 2017. And then kings that were further up, they could actually look back and see, well, that was prophesied back in Daniel. It happened in Cyrus. And now the things that were written before are happening right in my very time. And then people in 2017 can look and say, that's all happened. And that's what we're doing tonight. And that's the marvel of prophecy. And so it is that we'll take a brief look this evening at some of the accuracy of God's word. And what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at God's word and looking at the timeline as far as the three books is concerned with one particular motive in mind, is the fact that although we'll look at timelines, that the actual benchmark will be God's word. The capitalist will be God's word. We will use God's word as the anchor. And if everything else fits in, that's what we'll use. So we're going to look at some of the cost. We're going to have Cyrus. We've got Cambasus. Doris Hestispus, Exerces, these are the names of the people, Esther, that are contained in these books. Artaxerxes, which we read about this evening. Mordecai, we all know Mordecai. Shazbaza, Joshua, Zerubbabel, Haggai, who is contemporary with them, Zechariah, who is contemporary as well, Ezra, of course the baddies, the Samaritans, Reham, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, Tetaniah, She saw both an eye. Nehemiah. Sam Ballot. Tobiah. And last but no means least. Haman the Agagite. The epitome of evil. And although we're going to be looking at some of these this evening, we are not going to be looking at all of them. So for the purpose of this evening's talk, these are the characters that we are actually going to be considering as we go through the two different views that are set before us as far as the timeline is concerned. Now you may ask, is it important? 
Well, in my view, it is not a life changer. However, it does actually verify whether the books of es Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah are concurrent or sequential. Because one view specifies that the three kings that we will read about in Ezra chapter 4 are all referencing to the same king. Ahasuerus, Artaxerxes, and Darius. And they believe it is Darius Hestispus. Whereas so the other uh, view believes that those are three different kings in three different timelines. So what we plan to do is I'll just give you some a, a bit of brief background. First person we have is Cyrus, which was which we've already covered, who came into power in BC 539, and he lasted until 530. Then came Cambyses. Cambyses was his son. Cambyses had a brother called Smyrdas. So what happened was Cambyses had this thing about his brother Smyrdas. So he has him murdered. And while Cambyses is on military campaign, overpowering Egypt and trying to get uh, uh, overpower Ethiopia, on his way back, as a lot of conjecture as to how he died, some say that he he was he died from an infection of a wound as battle, and others say that he picked up a virus and he died from that. Whatever the outcome is, he died before he could actually get back to his throne. And so what happens is a, a Magian, which is of a tribe, who was aware of the murder of the brother Smyrdas, which would be the rightful heir to the throne, he assumes that he can take the throne. And his name is Gamodes. And what he does is he actually turns around and says to everybody, I am Smyrdas and I've come back to take which is rightfully mine. And hence the fact that he's phrased as the pseudo Smyrdas because he was, he was an imposter. And he takes the throne. But what actually happens is after Cambyses dies, is Darius Hestaspus, who is a high-ranking commander in the, uh, uh, the army, he becomes aware of this. He takes control of the army and he marches on Babylon. And when he gets to Babylon, he executes Smyrdas, pseudo Smyrdas, and then what he does is executes all those who follow him. And then he goes and proceeds to take control of the realm of the kingdom. And when he's taken control, he goes about <coughs> setting up as far as getting all the financials in position, getting rid of all the opposition that was uh, against him because he has quite a bit of uneasiness within the kingdom. And he is a very, very incredible um, person, ambitious, and an, an exceptional warrior. Now, after him comes Exercis. And after Exercis comes Artaxerxes, which is the son of Exercis. So with that brief history out of the way, we come to the title of this evening's talk, which is the puzzle of four. And you could be asking yourself, what is this puzzle? Well, those four areas are the main areas that cause the conjecture as to whether the three books, Ezra, Esther and Nehemiah are either concurrent or whether they are sequential. That's the age of Mordecai, the age of Ezra, Ezra chapter chapter 4, and um, the priests and the Levites of Ezra 2 and of um, Nehemiah chapter 10. And last of all, based on that, we come to a conclusion as to who this Azuherus actually is. So, as far as the timeline is concerned, it starts at 590, BC 598, which is the time when Jehoiakim was actually taken by 
um, Nebuchadnezzar through to Babylon. And it goes, I've put it down to 400 BC because that's the period that it actually overlaps into Artaxerxes. So based on that, one of the views is that, well, because the kings that are in there, in Esther, Ezra chapter 4, are all the same, referring, as for argument's sake, Ahasuerus isn't the name of a king, believe it is the title, like Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Ahasuerus would be a title of a king. And so it comes down to the point where you got Cyrus, Cambyses, and Darius, all mentioned in uh, um, in Ezra, but the S, the the Darius, uh, uh, the Ahasuerus in in Esther is actually Darius Hystaspus, and in Nehemiah, the uh, the the Artaxerxes is actually Darius Hystaspus. But then there's the other view, which considers that, well, they're not. They're three different kings, and they all fall into different timelines. So what is this conjecture all about? Well, it all comes about, the first one we'll look at is the age of Mordecai. Now, we read in Esther chapter 2, now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jah, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamin, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. So who is this Jeconiah? Well, Je Jeconiah, actually, the other, no, uh, other known name for Jeconiah is Jehoiachin. Now he reigned for, was 18 when he began to reign. And he reigned in Jerusalem three months. He did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh. And that was when the king of Babylon came up. And Jehoiachin and the king uh, uh, and all his princes and his officers, the king of Babylon took and he took him to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. So what's wrong with that? It doesn't seem like there's too much complication. Here's the problem. It's because if Mordecai was in the age era that is normally concerned where Exerces is situated, then that would have been around about uh, 486 BC. So what you have then is you have a situation that Jehoiachin is taken away to Babylon at 598 BC. And Mordecai was taken with him. So if for him to exist in that time frame would mean that he would have to be 125 years old to have lasted from the time if he was a baby in arms when he was taken at, with Jehoiachin, would have to be in a baby in arms to have lasted long enough to actually get through to the period where Exorcis began to reign. But he would actually have to even be older than that, because what would actually happen is when you got the era of the Purim, now the Purim was the era when Mordecai and Esther and the king, uh, uh, Ahasuerus, overcome the wicked Haman and they get rid of him, the Jews, because of the decree that goes out to say that the Jews can defend themselves. He declares a feast and that feast is called a Purim. Now that Purim happens 13 years into the reign of King Ahasuerus. So in actual fact, when you took this, take a look there, and I'll just zoom in on it, you'll see 473 is the time the Purim was done. So Mordecai would actually have to be quite a very old man 
at that time. For him to have been taken away with Jeconiah and to have lasted all the way through to King Ahasuerus, if Ahasuerus was in fact Xerxes. In other words, in that particular time frame. Now, although not impossible, bec uh, um, it was highly unlikely because the average person would be lost until about 95 to 100 years old, as opposed to 125, and some even say as much as 140. So then, that is the argument against, as far as Mordecai is concerned, against Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther being at different time frames. It is much more suitable for Mordecai, who would have been in Darius Hestapus' time frame, who came into power at 522 BC. Now, when he came into power at 522 BC, if you subtract 522, and because it was the uh, uh, 13th year of Purim, you subtract 13 from 522, leaves you 509, you subtract 509 from 598, it gives you an age of 89 years old. That's if he was reigning in the period of Darius Hystaspus. So that is the conclusion for the concurrent books of all those three books, all falling into the same, same time zone. But you see, there are other complications that arise from that. And we'll go as we go through them, we'll see. Because when you take a look at what it says in Esther chapter 2 and verse 6, you'll notice there that the word the and the word of, with the word son in between, there is no definite article. By definite article, I mean in the Hebrew language where it actually specified that this is a certainty, the son. Right? So, what the word son actually is, it's the word ben. Now, the word ben in Hebrew basically means a descendant. So, if you took a look at the original manuscripts, in the original manuscripts, the word the and the word of do not exist. It's only when a transliteration took place that the trans, uh, transliteration, the scholars had the ability to actually add it in because they felt it didn't change the thrust of what it was saying in that verse there. But what it's referring to, or possibly refers to, is either a descendant, an offspring, for argument's sake, a nation or a family. As an example, the son of man is a human being. In Numbers 23 at verse 19. It can also mean a grandson or people. So what you find is that the word son, this is going through the Lexham uh, uh, Hebrew Bible, says this. In the Bible, a son is a male begotten by a father. In a broader sense, sonship denotes a range of of familial, hereditary, and social and theological relationships. Biblical references to sons need to be understood in context of the extreme value that ancient cultures placed upon sons. As an example, Hebrews chapter nine, uh, Hebrews chapter seven at verse nine speaks about the concept of being in the loins of. And it talks up uh, the, uh, uh, the apostle Paul is talking about um, the, the experiences of Abraham with a, a high priest Melchizedek. And he says, As I may so say, Levi, also who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. That it doesn't sound very convincing. But when you look at it in the ESV version, one might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So the Hebrew writers had the, the style of when they referred to as sons, they were referring to descendants, and they actually didn't name all the people 
that were associated with that. Because if you look at the genealogy of those uh, of of Mordecai and Shim, uh, Shimei, there are quite a lot more, but they're not all mentioned for brevity's sake. Just to give you an idea, this is some of the newer translations. Uh, uh, the contemporary English version says, Kish was one of the people that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem when he took King Jeconiah of, Jeru of Judah to Babylon. Uh, New King James Version says, Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah of, of Judah. Uh, New Revised Standard Version says, Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives and uh, uh, carried away with King Jeconiah of Judah. Look at the New Living Translation says, His family had been among those who, with King Jeconiah of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. And of course, the, the Tanakh, um, says that Kish had been exiled from Jerusalem in a group that was carried into exile along with King Jeconiah of Judah. So you can see there is this understanding that it's not necessarily talking about him being the direct son, but him being a descendant of that. But there's one more complication when you're trying to factor in that, in fact, it was a period in the concurrent framework. Now, I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because Esther chapter 2, verses 2 to 3 says this. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, Let there be fair young virgins sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom, that they may gather together all the young virgins unto Shushan the palace. Now, the word young is actually the word adolescent. Now, when you actually look at the age of adolescent, average age, it's between 10 and 19. But then we're going to factor in the issue that, well, how do we actually consider what age these people were going to be? Well, between 10 and 19. So what age would Esther have been, taking that into consideration? Well, Mordecai, given the time frame, if he was in a concurrent period, would have been 89 years old at the time. So if we take the mean average of how many years difference it is between a uncle and a niece or a nephew is 32 years. That is on the internet, the average research, right? So let's say it's, it's even less. Well, let's say it's more. But the mean average is 32. Now, if you take 89, the age of Mordecai, you subtract 32 years, leaves Esther being 57 years old, far from a young virgin. So the concurrent theory has its issues as well. So what's the middle ground here? And this is what I've tried to do is look at the middle ground and use scripture as the anchor. Well, the middle ground has a conclusion it's in my view. And that is taking into consideration the factors of the word Ben referring to a descendant as opposed to not having the son, which it would normally be the definite article, the Hebrew word ha. That definite article does not exist there. And that's why I've put them all in italics. So looking at the word ben, effectively, this verse is referring to the lineage of Mordecai as opposed to his history. Then we get the age of Ezra. Now, these are the factors. This is why there was such a conjecture as to the age of Mordecai. It could possibly be three different kings because Mordecai would have to be so old. Well, actually, there's no specific time frame given for Mordecai. 
All it's doing is it's specifying the lineage. In other words, it's giving us an indication of who some of his descendants were, the ancestors were. And it's actually so that you can make a reference point. But it's of no major consequence to the story at hand, which was really about God's deliverance. So let's take a look at Ezra, the age of Ezra. Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, this is in Ezra chapter 7, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sariah, the son of Azariah, the son of Hilkiah. You can see once again, the same thing appears. It's got the italics separated in between the son and the next name. And it, on the same reckoning, once again, it's the same word, Ben. So the theory comes in is, well, hold on. If Ezra is the son of Sariah, the actual firstborn of Sariah, then given the fact that Sariah was murdered, executed by Nebuchadnezzar, in BC 586, when Zedekiah rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar and uh, Nebuchadnezzar's army came, conquered Jerusalem, laid siege to it, took out uh, 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 Sariah and executed him outside the city. So let's call it the anchor. It's BC 586. Right. So what we have then is a situation that if indeed... Ezra was falling into a different time frame, which is actually in the time frame of Artaxerxes, the two views, one concurrent, one sequential. It's actually then, for him to fall into the time frame, or what it's referring to there, in Artaxerxes' time frame, he would have to be 128 years old. And as you can see down at the bottom, uh, um, that was when um, Jeconiah was taken. In actual fact, uh, when Ezra dedicates the walls, he would have to be 142 years old because it was in BC 444. So those who say that it's concurrent are saying, well, that's all fine. 142 years old? I don't think so. But you see, the argument comes back as far as the concurrent in a respect that they say, well, if it was in BC 586, it was the seventh year that Ezra was commissioned by Artaxerxes to go to Jerusalem, the seventh year of Artaxerxes. So if you took the date that Artaxerxes uh, uh, or Darius Histaspus came into power, which is BC 522. You minus the seven, which it gives you a figure, and you subtract that from 586. It brings him to a more respectable age of 57 years old. So, therefore, that's what it should be, right? But you see, here comes a few complications. Because, like I say, it says there that Ezra was the son of Sariah, but not the son, he was the descendant of Sariah. If you drop the definite article, you see that what that word the at the bottom in a, a less than and greater than, that's the only definite article in that entire verse. And it's the same word bin. But here's the important thing you should, if you take a look. At, well, I've put there the uh, uh, TWOT, which is the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. It's pretty much telling you that it is a definite article. But in First Chronicles chapter 6 at verse 3, you see those names in bold? All those names in bold are excluded in Ezra chapter 7. So this comes back again to the fact that 
It's not telling you the entire ge uh, uh, chronological history of them. For brevity's sake, it's basically giving you an indication of the lineage of that. In the same way as in Matthew chapter 1, what does it say? The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, who? The son of Abraham, the son, uh, son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes on to give that. Right? But here's the thing. We were to believe that it was actually Sariah that was taken. Not quite, because at the bottom of First Chronicles, it tells us that Azariah fathered Sariah. Sariah fathered Josedek. And Josedek went into exile when Yahweh sent Judah and Jerusalem into exile by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. But hold on. I thought Sariah was the father of Ezra. And this is saying that Sariah fathered Jehozadak. And he went in, Jehozadak went into, into uh, exile because his father, Sariah, was executed outside the city. Now, just to make sure that we understand, it is Jehozadak that is actually taken by King Nebuchadnezzar in to exile. The other fact is this. All those names there, all those sons, bear in mind, if you were reading it, you would have to read it as descendant. If you wanted to use the word of... You could, but in original manuscripts it's not there, and there's no definite article. And the reason why the word the makes such a difference is because it's saying the son. Without a definite article, it's this son, which means descendant or grandson. So here's the thing. It is not true of most of those names that they went into exile. A tree of them. None of them did. Nor did Sariah. He was executed outside Jerusalem walls. So you can you see there the way the Hebrew uh, uh, translators and Hebrew scribes and Hebrew scholars specified is they give an example of the lineage of which it's coming from. So let's assume that Ezra. Is 68 years old. If the anchor was 586, and going back to the date of the that he dedicates the wall at, at uh, 4 BC triple four, how would we arrive at that? Well, it's quite simple. It's because it is more likely that Ezra was the grandson of Sariah. With the mean average between father and grandson being 60 years, between 30 years as given in Matthew chapter 1 for a generation, it would equate to BC 586 minus those two generations and with, uh, uh, as per Matthew 1 verse 17, subtract 458 and you get an age of 68. So with the concurrent you get 57. And with a 68. Now, just to show you that it is my view looking at the actual Hebrew word, the word ben, and the way the word is structured, and minus the definite article, it's my view that it's referring to the lineage, as do many others. But also, I found some of these books that I had archived, some of them going back to 1741. Now, the one is from Charles Rowland, and the other one is the historian's history of the world. Rowland says this in section Artaxerxes sends Esdras. Esdras is the Hebrew name for Ezra in the uh, um, Apocrypha. And afterwards, Nehemiah to Jerusalem. And he says this, Before I proceed in the history of the Persians and Greeks, I shall relate in a few words 
What events happened among the people of God during the first 20 years of Artaxerxes, which is an essential part of the history of that prince? If in the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, Esdras obtained of the king and his seven counselors an ample commission. You see what he goes on further to say? Esdras was descended from Sariah. Not the son, which supports what I've said as far as the word Ben is concerned, minus the definite article. But the historian's history of the world say this. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, Longimus, that's what his name was. Artaxerxes was a title which is in 458 BC, which is the date that I use for the sequential date. More than half a century after the establishment of the temple, a new colony of Jews left Babylon for Jerusalem under the leadership of Ezra, grandson of the priest Sariah. That fits in perfectly with the Hebrew word Ben. Right, so we've covered Ezra and Mordecai. What about this one that we read this evening? Because this, in verse 5, the adversaries, they hired counselors against them, against Zerubbabel and Jeshua, to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus king of Persia, even unto the days of Darius. Well, that's Darius Hestispus. Now, that word frustrate, it means to break, to make void, to come to naught, to be dissolved. So that wasn't just like, oh, so frustrated. I'm talking about they made it impossible for them to work so that they gave up. See, the big problem is, it's from verse 6 through to verse 23. You got, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, beginning in his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah. Remember, we read that. And then in the next verse, verse 7, and in the days of Artaxerxes, Rehem the commander and Shimshai the scribe write a letter. So we have that word frustrate. Look at verse 11. This is the copy of the letter sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes. But this is where the interesting point comes in. You see, because there's a break. From verse 5, you've got the word temple, you've got the word house. What's it referring to? It's referring to the temple. From verse 6 onwards, all you have is Jerusalem. This is Rehem, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe. You've got Jerusalem, city, walls, foundation, city, walls, city, city, city. No mention of house. No mention of temple. Then you've got from verse 16 to verse 20, we certify the king that if the city be built again and the walls thereof set up, by this mean thou hast, you shall have no portion on this side of the river. And that's Shimsh, Rehem the commander and Shimshai the scribe. And they say the city have made insurrection against kingdom. It is rebellion and sedition and kings were over Jerusalem. It's a city, this city should not be builded. Rehem and Shimshai describe any companions went up in haste to Jerusalem unto the Jews and made them to cease by force and power. So when you just analyze that, you've got the word temple and house in verse 1 through to 5. From verse 6, referring to Artaxerxes, and Ahasuerus, all you've got is the word city and walls. 
So what does that tell us? Well, with a concurrent view, it's telling us, well, there you go. It stopped until the, the, the period of Darius. And then straight after it, in verse 6, you got A.S. you hear us, and you've got Artaxerxes mentioned. And in following that, in verse 24, you've got Darius. Pretty conclusive. Darius, Artaxerxes, and A.S. Yerus all have to be the same person. It's just different titles for the same king. But you see, there's a difference between temple, city, or walls. Because in verse 1, you have temple. It's the Greek the Hebrew word, heichal. And it means palace or temple. In those particular verses, in that chapters, the word temple or house of God, in the Lexham Bible Sense Dictionary, it means a building considered as the house or dwelling place of a Jewity where the Jewity can be worshipped. In Strong's, it says that it's a house. But the city in Strong's means it's a place larger than a village. And the word walls is a wall used to fortify a city. So here comes the complication. Given that the walls, and everybody agrees on this, was only reconvened under the governor of Judah, being Nehemiah, why is the structure then so complicated? Because what we've got is we've got temple in verses uh, chapter 4 up to verse 5. And then from verse four, 6 all the way down to 23, it's only walls and city. And then it mentions a decree that was given and an edict. So two questions are asked. Raz, would Zerubbabel and Joshua, given that they, after being spoken to and enlightened and uplifted by Zechariah and Haggai the prophet, and they resume the building of the temple, would they do that, given the fact that <clears throat> disobeying a decree by resuming temple work? Would they actually risk that? Considering mere Samaritans were capable of frustrating the work on temple, this being a decree considered far more serious. Fact, instant execution. Do you remember what Darius says? He says, Darius says, I've looked through, and he says, keep away from them. And if you don't do this, then I will go pull a beam out of your house and I'll impale you on it and your house will be made a dunghill. That's how serious it is. But they did it. Why did they do that? Well, it's quite simple. That's the structure. Temple, house. Darius, then Ahasuerus, then uh, Artaxerxes. But you'll see, all the way through here, and this refers to wall and city. And then it reconvenes here, Darius, house and house. So in reality, if you were putting this in the sequential order, right? Like they say, and it's referring to all the same person, then it equally has to apply to how the work was unfolded. First of all, the temple foundation, then the temple, then the dedication of the temple, then the rebuilding of the walls. So in actual fact, what you would have to do, you have to switch it around. Because it would then be house, 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 house. And then walls and cities. So what does that tell us? The easiest explanation is this. And it's quite simple. 
and are supported by the Hebrew, is that from verse 6 through to verse 23 of parentheses, he's given an interlude. He's saying that, look, we had a situation in Jerusalem when the adversaries came against and they wanted to worship with us. And, we, and what does Zerubbabel say? Sorry, you have nothing to do with us. We will build a house for our God. And then he went about frustrating your work. And we just looked at what the word frustrate meant. They brought it into the work. And it tells you that, that at all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even unto the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And then he goes on to say how they threw the two different time frames, the other two time frames with Rehum the commander, Shimshai the scribe, Artaxerxes, and Ahasuerus. And then what he does? He reconvenes, then sees the work, that's in verse 24, sees the work of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. So it ceased all the days, ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Then the prophets came. So what actually happens is the, the, the writer picks up again the narrative from verse 5 and continues on with the story. It's like me saying to you, I've had a few complications with my computer. But I'm also aware of other people three weeks later are going to have the same problem because it's an inherent bug in this computer. That's what he's doing. He's giving you a parenthesis of the circumstances that happened in those king's reigns. And that's a fact they did. There's a bolt of lightning out of the blue. And this is what was conclusive for me. It's because in chapter 5 and verse 3 it says, at the same time. What was the same time? The Hebrew Discourse Bible actually gives us the declarative sentences. What that word same time means is this. It's a declarative sentence is usually seen as an assertion of fact. And it usually uses the indicative mood and the most prototypical word, order. The subjunctive mood is also used for declarative sentences. The purpose of declarative sentence is usually to express statements of fact. So what actually happened? In verse 1, Haggai and Zechariah lift their spirits, say, you waited long enough, get your act into gear and do this work. God's house is sitting here being wasted away while you guys are looking after your own best interests. As the rubble and Jeshua pick up their tools and start to work again. And then what happens? Tataniah comes onto the scene. So you see, it says at the same time, Tataniah. Why would he use the word at the same time? Well, he used the word at the same time because he was making a reference to the exact time now when they picked up their tools. And it says that because it says, who gave you this decree? What are the names of the people that are doing this work? And then from that point on, it generates into the situation when it's actually read out by Darius Hestispus. They actually write a letter, Tataniah the governor, and his associate actually send off the, uh, the letter to Darius Hestispus. But you see, there's another thing that I actually wanted to point out, just to show you that I didn't stop there to prove that there is a break in the sentence. That is called the Hebrew cantillation diagram. The Hebrew cantillation is, it's a chanting. And each vocal cord determines a pause or a break in it. So when they read those chapters, they don't read them like we do. Like, at the same time, they'll chant it. When they read from the Torah. Now, if you take a look 
at that section there. Can you see the line? And you see what's above it is chapter 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6. The Hebrew cantillation is telling us that across the board, there's a break in the sentence between verse 5 and verse 6, which would explain the parentheses. And only reconvenes down in 24 at the bottom. So the Hebrew cantillation Bible is pretty much concurs. But then there's the long acre genre um, um, <laughs> analysis of the Bible. And there's a temporal time frame. And, and what they're talking about is at that time it says temporal time frames of that which are fronting of time related information to establish a specific time frame for the clause that follows. Temporal time frames accomplish two functions to establish a new point in time for the clause or discourse that follows and to draw extra attention to changes in time within the discourse effectively sharpening comparisons or contrasts so when he talks around and he says in verse 6 and in verse 6 in the reign of Ahasuerus it's a new time frame that's what it's saying that is what the Hebrew Discourse Bible and the Hebrew Cantillation Bible is saying. It's saying between verses 5 and 6 there's a break. Why? Because there's a new time frame being inserted there. So between verses 6 through to verses 23 is parenthesized because it's pointing to a time frame where there's actually two or three different kings that are new. They don't exist in the time frame that they're referring to. So that is the sequential uh, uh, going from Ezra and Nehemiah. And last but no means least is the is the, the priests. Because what is referred to is the fact that hold on, we got the priests that come, we got Zerubbabel and we got Jeshua the priest. And they came because they were actually taken out by Jeconiah when Nebuchadnezzar took them. And for them to have been in that time frame is fine. However, their name also appears in Nehemiah chapter 10. And that is in the year 444. So they're also going to be well over 100 years old. It doesn't compute. All right, so let's just take a look. Coming back to Ezra chapter 5. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josedek. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 10, and the, can you see that little double arrows? It's the only definite article. The Levites. In other words, you can be certain it's the Levites. Right? And then Jeshua, the son of Azaniah. Hold on. This Jeshua is the son of Josedek. You're not talking about the same people here. You will see there's a little, um, that little mark there. That little mark there is what is called a forward pointing reference and that is also once again the hebrew discourse bible and what it means is this it's forward pointing target the use of pronouns like this are pointing forward to a target that has not yet been mentioned so you can once again it's making reference to the offspring and lineage you will see that the first one, it says, right, in Ezra chapter 2, you've got Joshua. And then you've got, and then it goes down to the, how many? No, 974. <coughs> but then you've got Cadmiel and the one next to him. And that goes down to there. 
So if you're looking at the lineage, you've got Joshua, but you've got Cadmiel, and it's telling you that, well, it's a separate line. He is associated there, and he's associated there, but Cadmiel and that one there is coming down a different path to contribute to this. Right? Now let's go to Nehemiah chapter 10. And what we have is Jeshua, the son of Azaniah. It's a bullet, <laughs> and it's pointing forward to a target as well. It's separating it. So what do we get? Once again, we have a situation that's pointing forward, and it's giving you an indication of the lineage. Now just to give you an indication of what I'm talking about, what is the first one? It was Joshua, and then it came down, correct? Right, what do we got there? Then we got Joshua. Reversed. And then you got there. And then up here, what did you see in the previous one? You had Joshua, and you had Cadmiel coming down on two separate lines. There we got Joshua, we got Cadmiel, offspring. And there we got Hadaliah, and then the 74 men. So just to show you that what I'm saying is a bit more accurate, there you've got it. Two of them in parallel. And what have you got? You've got that one there, Jediah, but that one there, Joshua. And this one here, is Joshua, Kadiah. Can you see? That one there, there's Kadiah. And this one here, here's Kadiah. This one's telling you that Kadiah is the offspring of Joshua. This one here is telling you that he's contributing towards that offspring. So in actual fact, what it's referring to once again is lineage. It's giving you a indication and an overview of the descendants of that person, not the actual facts of specifics with using the uh, definite article. Well, this is the definite son. I'm definitely a son of, of Steve. No, it's not saying that. It's saying I'm a descendant of Steve. <laughs> when you take a look at the actual structure of how the um how the the kings are actually in every single chronological book there is in actual fact brother john thomas in eureka brother john thomas in alphas israel brother john thomas the book unsealed brother robert roberts in christendom astray etc all point to artaxerxes being in BC 598, where he gave the second decree and the last decree that specifies the 70 weeks or the 490 years between the last decree and the death of the Messiah. So this is factual. According to all the pioneers and according to all the actual translators and according to all the timelines. But you can see that there's Cyrus, Cambyses, the pseudo Smyrdas, which is only seven months, Doris Hestispus, right? You've got Exorcus, Artaxerxes, and you've got Esther. Can you see how they staggered? Slightly overlapping at some periods. So then when you move that down and you put Haggai and Zechariah there, right? And you put a, a, a Zerubbabel. <laughs> and you put Jeshua, well, it all fits perfectly in line with the time frame of each person. So you have it not only fitting in with the timeline, you have it actually fitting in perfectly with Scripture. And that there is just to give you an indication of where Artaxerxes Sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem. This is a, a, um, a chart that I put together. 
And there, 444, Ezra reads the law. Ezra returns to Artaxerxes in BC 433. So he was there for the best part of 11 years. And then one year later, he goes back to Jerusalem because he hears that Sam Ballot is married into the family. And Tobiah. Very interesting. So, what we have really is a situation where we have the reign of Ahasuerus, from what you can automatically assume there is, in my view, Xerxes. You have Artaxerxes and you have Darius. All of those are independent kings as opposed, in different time frames, as opposed to the reign of Darius, Tisdespus, being a title also, reigning also under a title of Ahasuerus and reigning under a title of Artaxerxes. It is my view that they are all different kings in different time frames. Exerces, in short, is Ahasuerus. Long-winded way to get there, but if you look at the time sheet that I've, the one that I've given you there, you will actually look, and I've extracted this from all different sources, right, to put together the time frame. You'll see there where it says Exerces, it'll say there, also known as Ahasuerus. Here we are. Here it is. So that's it. Sorry, it's taken so long, but next ones will be a bit of a breeze compared to this because what we're going to be doing in the next is we are going to be taking a look at some of the lessons learned. Tonight we've looked at the puzzle of four. In the next talk, we'll be looking at what lessons can we learn from Ezra, what lessons can we learn from Nehemiah, and what lessons can we learn from Esther. It is an amazing topic. It is an amazing study to look at. And the reason why I labored on this tonight is because what is the point of thinking that, well, Mordecai is in Susha while Ezra is in Jerusalem? Uh, it didn't make sense to me. Although some of the points proved, and when I looked through some of the indications, it, 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 it tend to, to weigh strongly in that. So I decided to approach it from a different angle where I put Scripture as the anchor. And if the other factors like timelines and historians fitted in, then I would use it. But it was more of the scriptural side of it by working out in the 13th year of and in working backwards and using those resources and that's proven to be the deciding factor for me in my eyes but as i say i am not an authority on this and we'll continue next week as we look at the lessons learned through the efforts of ezra zerubbabel and jeshua in the reconvening of the work of the temple of the house of god <laughs>